This is what's happening at The Rock. Grace and peace, freedom family and friends. These are your weekly announcements. Masks are strongly recommended, but they are not mandatory. We will continue to monitor the COVID numbers and will make adjustments accordingly. We have resumed baby dedications here at Freedom Rock. If you desire to have your child dedicated, please contact the church office. Senior Members Connect will hold Bingo with Bishop on Thursday, March 9th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. here at Freedom Rock. Bingo with Bishop is for seniors ages 60 and above. We look forward to seeing you. The nursery has reopened. Children ages 6 months to 5 years pre-K are welcome to attend. And if you're interested in volunteering, please contact your connection team leader, Angela Winston, for more details. Mark your calendar for Freedom Rock's Rock Community Resource Center. Every third Saturday from 9 until noon, you will have access to food, toiletries, life essentials, and much more. And do not worry about the cost because it's free at Freedom. For the month of March, the third Saturday lands on March 18th. We look forward to seeing you. Elder Betty Cole is your outreach director. And for more information, contact the number or email address on your screen. The Ministry of Care will meet every fourth Monday at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Elder Cedric Dubos is your connection team leader. Freedom family and friends, let us come together and wish Sanaya Farrell a happy birthday. Sanaya recently celebrated her 13th birthday back on February 8th. Happy birthday, Sanaya, from all of us at Freedom Rock Cathedral. And happy birthday to Roshonda Edwards. Miss Edwards recently celebrated her birthday on Thursday, March 2nd. Happy birthday, Roshonda, from all of us at Freedom Rock Cathedral. So if you have a birthday, an anniversary, or you would just like to give someone a shout out, send us your email to freedomrock at frcfc.org. And for birthdays and anniversaries, make sure to list the first and last name as well as the date. These have been your weekly announcements and we ask you to keep all announcements in mind and be reminded that Freedom Rock Cathedral is locally committed and globally commissioned. Hey, grace and peace, man. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Elder Thomas Key, the growth strategist here at Freedom Rock Cathedral. I want to thank you for tuning in. I need you to do me one favor. I've asked you this before. I'm going to ask you again. I would love for you, absolutely love for you to like, share, and comment, and let us know where you're watching from. The Lord has a word for you on today. So go ahead and prepare your notebooks or your iPads so you can take notes and watch God speak to your heart right now. Psalms 107 declares exactly what we need. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. It then goes on to say, for his mercy endureth forever. But verse 3 is the one I love the most. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I just believe this morning that I'm in the house with some people right now that know that their soul was on their way to hell and yet the Lord intervened on their behalf. Let the redeemed of my God say so in this house this morning. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Glory to God. Grace and peace to you this morning. Certainly we bring you greetings in the name of God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit whom we love, honor, and submit to on a daily basis. It is truly an honor to be standing before you. I don't take it for granted that I am standing before you on today in the stead of our own Bishop Hedgeman. Go ahead and give Bishop and First Lady a great hand clap of praise. Glory to God. 
So I'm honored to stand in his stead on today. It's such an honor. We honor them on today, the vessels of this house, as Revelation calls them, the angels of this house. We certainly are honored. Uh, we thank God so much for all those that are present here on today. Thank God for my wife who is here but working in the nursery on today. Uh, it is such an honor to be standing before you on today. There is a word from the Lord. And in case you were expecting me to come sad and eulogizing, you are in the wrong place. For God has a word for the hearts of his people on this morning. You're in the right place if you came for a word. Now, if you came for a misery, I don't know what to give you. But if you're here for the word, God's got you covered. Let's turn our Bibles, John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We'll begin reading at verse number 17. We'll read out of the King James Version. John chapter 11. We'll begin reading at verse number 17. We're going to do a dual text scripture this morning. We're going to do uh, John, and then we're going to flip back to Job and do another. And that will be how we get our text uh, this morning. The book of John chapter 11, verse number 17, begins reading King James Version. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already talking about Lazarus. Now Bethany was a nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furloughs off by five miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then Martha, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Flip back to Job. We're going to do Job chapter 1. We're only reading two verses here. Verses 20 and 22. 20 through 22. The Bible says, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground. And he worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord give it, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I want to use for a text this morning, Managing my heart after unexpected loss. Managing my heart after unexpected loss. Father, we give you glory on today, God. We thank you so much that you have saturated this place with your spirit, God. Now anoint me afresh, God, to do your will. Father, you have sent the word. Now empower me as your messenger to speak it with clarity and understanding. God, I give you glory now for what only you can do for in us and through us, God, that you will speak and we will have clarity, God. We give you glory for our hearts and minds on today. For it is in your son's Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord on today. Hear this, saints of God, if you are in the place on this morning. Every day that you wake up, every day that your eyes open and your head comes off of a pillow, you are in not just a fight for your life, you are in not at war just for your soul, you are at war for your heart. For you see, the heart is one of the most important places where we can receive and where we can believe things by faith. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 that the heart is the place where our belief in salvation comes. For if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our hearts. Yeah, there we go. We're on it. We're on it. 
So it's one of the places where my salvation is established. The heart is also one of the places God wants to pour into because it has the, the ability to mimic his own heart. The Bible said that David had a heart after God's own heart. So God pours into that place so that it can begin to mimic the heart of God. But it's also the place, hear this, thanks of God, where Satan wants to corrupt you the most. Got to know that. For it is in your heart that if he can corrupt, then he understands that controlling of your life becomes easy. Well, let me say it this way. If he has the ability to shift your heart away from the Father, then he has the unique ability to sift your life away from what he's called. So if I'm not careful in my heart, I will find myself shifted away and then sifted from his will. And the enemy knows that the easiest way to get access to your life is through your heart. See, it's hard to shift a person's beliefs. So if you are a Coca-Cola person, and I said, man, Pepsi is better than Coke, that's your belief. You will fight me to death saying Coke is better. So it's hard to shift your beliefs. It's hard to transfer your doctrine, what you have a doctrine about. It's hard to change that. But it is very easy to gain access to your life by shifting of your heart through the use of satanic devices. We call these things pain. We call them suffering. We call them difficulties. We call them the hard things that we go through all the time that if not managed appropriately, they're going to give Satan access to our lives. But if we're not careful, we will find ourselves, no matter how long you've been in church, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how long you believe God, you can find yourself sitting in this place, shifted away in your heart and being sifted in your life. Satan has full control, full access. He's able to do everything he wants to do. He's able to move and manipulate you the way you want to move. And before you know it, a person whose heart was pleasing to God, it was lifting God up, it was, it was giving God all the glory that was available to it, has now found themselves questioning if the relationship with God is even worth it. God, why am I even doing this salvation thing? Why, why am I here? God, what is this about? God, I don't trust you anymore. You have forgotten me, God. See, a shifted heart will lead to a sifted life that leads you to question God. And it doesn't happen all of a sudden. It can happen pretty instantaneously. Satan is so slick with the device. How many of you can be honest and say, you've left church one Sunday, man, and I'm telling you, the, the, the choir and the praise team just sung you into his glory, and Bishop preached down a word from heaven, and it just positioned you right where you need to be. I mean, you, you felt the presence of God. You knew it. I mean, you, you, it was like it was just up on you. The presence was there. You knew it was there. And you left out going, God, nothing will affect how I feel after today. And all it took was the wrong person or the right circumstance. And now you're out of all of that place you were in and find yourself in a place of dysfunction. I mean, I mean, it, it, you know, a, a social media post shook you out of your position. I mean, I mean, your kids start acting a fool and shift you out of position. I mean, I mean, somebody who can't drive turning out in front of you in the car and, and, and blocking your way and you're trying to get by and Okay, that's just me. Okay, okay. But you, nothing's worse than somebody who turns out and drives slower than you were driving. You're like, the devil is on you. But we find ourselves 
out of position easily because we have been shifted from where we were and now we're moving out of position where God can have access. But it is so imperative on today. Hear me, people of God, that we don't find ourselves in the wrong position in this season. As it understands, uh, I found that very few circumstances in any person's life challenges this ability like unexpected loss. I mean, when I know something is coming, I have the abilities to adjust. I can, I can shift. I can, I can make a plan. I can, I can, I can position myself to know this thing is coming. I, I'm, I'm okay with what's going to happen because I know this thing is prepared to come. I'm, I'm ready to adjust who I am so that I can be ready for it. But when it's unexpected, now I'm not only dealing with the pain of the loss, but I'm dealing with the questions of the why. I'm dealing with the emotions of the how. I'm dealing with everything that goes with it. And now it has a snowball effect where it is rolling me downhill out of control. And now I don't even know where I am or what I'm doing anymore. See, anybody that can be honest, that we, we found ourselves like that before. The unexpected has a position in us to cause us to shift from our position. Now, when I was preparing this, the Lord showed me something so beautiful. He said, he said, son, death is not the only way or the primary way that unexpected loss is introduced into our lives. Made me think, huh, you sure, Lord? It's pretty easy. We can, we can go there pretty quick. He said, no, 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 no. Unexpected loss has its way of finding its way into your lives from a lot of different directions. It can be the loss of a relationship with someone you've had as a friend or a confidant for years. And now no one is dead, but the relationship is broken. And now you're questioning God, what has happened here? How am I in this position of brokenness? Unexpected loss can happen in financial stability. Stock market crash, cryptocurrency crash, loss of a job, loss of the abilities to pay mortgages and do those things, layoffs that you weren't expecting. It can come in that way. It can come in the loss of your functioning, your abilities. People in a car accident, one day you're up running around and being functional, and the next day you're in a wheelchair, and someone is having to roll you around, and now you're in unexpected loss. So it's not always death that's introduced as unexpected loss. But death is one of the ways that it can happen. But regardless of how unexpected loss comes, I found out that it has the unique ability to shift our hearts quickly and suddenly. And if we're not careful, it will allow the enemy so much access that he's going to sift our lives right out from under us. But it is my assignment on today, yeah, to make sure through comparison and contrasting that you don't leave this place ignorant of Satan's devices. That you have a knowledge of how the enemy wants to work so that you will always be in position to hear from heaven and receive the word of God. And walk out the plan God has for your life. Because whether you know it or not, whether somebody has said it to you today or not, God has been too good to you for you to give up now. Oh, I'm going to say that again because that, that's, that's the wrong reply. God has been too good to you to give up now. I believe I have some witnesses that's willing to tell a neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, God has been too good to you for you to give up now. And if we're not careful, this loss will cause us to be in a place where nothing about his word, his will, or his way 
is even something we care for, desire, or want. So it's vital that God begins to deal with us through this problem of unexpected loss. So today the Holy Ghost will help us. He's going to use the backdrop of loss of a loved one to help us learn how to handle unexpected loss. Yeah, we're going to use that as the backdrop. But there's some wisdom that's going to come in learning how to handle unexpected loss. Know this. There's two ways that I am able to handle unexpected loss. I can do it in his spirit or I can do it in my flesh. In his spirit or in my flesh. See, in his spirit has the job of sustaining my heart. In my flesh has the job of shifting my heart. And if I'm not careful, I'll be walking out one of these areas and not even know they're a satanic advice or satanic device. So it's important that God speaks to us on today through his word. So let's go ahead and look at the word. Let's go back to John chapter 11. We'll begin again at verse 17. <clears throat> we'll do it out of the new living. John chapter 11. So we can see what these devices are. So we know how to handle this. John chapter 11. We're going to just kind of talk down through. Uh, the, the, the whole book of John 11 introduces us to the story of Jesus, Lazarus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are sister and brothers. And they all know Jesus. This is, he's not unfamiliar with them. Jesus gets the word that Lazarus is sick. Tells the disciples, it's good that he's sick. God is going to get glory out of this sickness. So it says, instead of going to Lazarus, he stayed where he was. It's cool. He's Jesus. He can do what he wants to do. Uh, stayed there a little bit longer. Then he gets another word that Lazarus is now dead. Tells the disciples, hey, come on. We need to go and we need to see about what's going on. We're going to go through Judea into Jerusalem so that we can get ready to go see Lazarus. But he's in Jerusalem. He's getting ready to go to Judea so that he can see what's going on with Lazarus and the family. <clears throat> so the Bible tells us in John chapter 11, it says, um, beginning at verse number 18, New Living, it says, Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. It says, but when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. I, I don't think you know what that means. M Martha is about to check Jesus. She, look, look, she is about to get angry with the Lord. M M this is the equivalent of a person seeing your headlights pull up in the driveway and running out the front door and screaming at you through the window of your car. Martha had lost her mind. She was about to check Jesus. Listen to what she told him. Listen, listen, listen. You got to see it. Says that uh, when she got to him, she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. So you see, the first thing that we do when we are mismanaging our heart and getting shifted by the enemy is we blame God. Yeah, not just Martha, even Mary did it. You read on down verse 32, Mary does the same thing. She blames Jesus for Lazarus' death. So that's what we do a lot. When we don't understand, when we don't know, the first thing we want to do is we want to blame God for what's going on. If we don't blame God, then we find ourselves in number two. We want to character compare or character assassinate. Woo! Let's talk about that one. Character compare. What is that, Winston? Character compare means that 
when we have unexpected loss and it's someone that we love, the first thing we want to do is compare the character of someone else we know who we thought should have died first. I can't believe God took Momo. Uncle Joe don't care about nobody. He hates the whole world. Can't believe God. What? You messed up, God. He's a horrible person. Nobody like him. That's why nobody go by there. See, we want a character compare. Or we want to do what Mary and Martha did. We want a character assassinate. Let's look at this. Look, look. Man, I wish I had time. I really want to show you this so you can dissect the disrespect that they had because they had their hearts shifted. Watch this, watch this. Go to verse 27 if you don't mind. Look at what, look at what um, Martha says to Mary about Jesus. Now, when she came to Jesus, she came with a little bit of respect, even though she was checking. She called him Lord. Lord, I, I have knowledge of who you are. Your position, I humble myself under. But watch how she tells Mary who's looking for her. Because apparently her talk didn't go the way she wanted it to go with Jesus. So now Jesus said, well, go get your sister. Tell her to come see me. So it doesn't say that, but it, it kind of gives you that context. So, you know, I, I'm not getting nowhere with you. Go get me the other person. This, this ain't working. So, so, so. Uh, uh, verse 27 says, uh, uh, verse number, let's see here. Um, he, so Jesus is trying to talk to her. He's telling her he's the resurrection and the life. Uh, she doesn't want to listen. So uh, she finally says, yes, Lord. Uh, whatever. Yeah, Lord, I got you. Uh, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's coming to the world. Says, then she returned to her sister Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners, and this is what she told her. She didn't say the Lord is looking for you. What did she say? Hey, that teacher joke over there want to deal with you. I didn't told him what I thought about him. You go tell him so now we both can be on the same page. Disrespect. Character assassinations. How many people have we chopped up their character because we had shifted hearts due to unexpected loss? Character compare, character assassinate. Third thing we do is we demand an understanding. God, I need to know why. You'll find this, you can write this in the margins. We won't turn there. Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. Some people came to Jesus and told them, Pilate had murdered some people in the temple and mixed their blood with the worship blood. But when you study it out, they're not telling him to inform him. They're telling him because they're demanding he gives an answer for what happened. And Jesus checks them so smoothly. He says, do you believe that they died because they were more unrighteous than you? Or do you believe you're still alive because you're more holy than they are? Letting them know that all of us have an appointed time to die, Hebrews 9, 27. So nobody is going to escape what God has said, nor can we predetermine how it happens. But the sovereignty of God is more important than my emotions. So even when I feel like I deserve to understand, God, I submit to your will greater than my preference. Oh, man, that, that's, that's the place we need to. God, I submit to your will. And it's more important than my preference. So we try to demand the understanding. Number four, the fourth way we dysfunctionally handle this is we nosedive into dysfunction. Un unexpected loss can throw your life into a tizzy if you're not careful. It can affect every relationship you have. It will affect your job performance. It affects everything about you. And you look up a year later and you're nowhere near the person you were a year before. Everything about you has hit a collapse point and now you're just looking up wondering, how did I get here? And the reason we're there is because we didn't properly manage unexpected loss. But I'm so glad 
that God doesn't leave me in dysfunction and not give me his word on how to move forward. I say that again. I'm so glad that God doesn't leave me in dysfunction and not give me access to his word. For my Bible has yet to leave me without an answer on how to handle anything God has called my life to go through. For the word says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for my doctrine, reproof, corrections, and righteousness so that I will be thoroughly furnished meaning that the word would never miss as long as I am centered in the word to hear what he's saying. So how do I handle unexpected loss, Winston? Teach me God's method. Teach me God's will. Because if I don't, I'm going to find myself in this place. I already see it. I've been doing some of the stuff that you just got through mentioning. And I don't want to do it any longer. So if that's you and you're here, you're in the right place. Because God is about to send you his word on how to handle your heart so you don't mismanage it. Go back again to Job chapter 1 and let's, let's study this out. Because there's something powerful that we need to see here in Job 1. So the book of Job chapter 1, we know the story of Job. Uh, if you're not familiar, I would encourage you to read it. Job was a man who um, his life was truly blessed. Uh, Job had, he was blessed in the areas of his family. He was blessed in the areas of his possession. He was blessed in the area of his position. Job's life was blessed. The Bible tells us that the sons of God or the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan finds his way there too. So in case you didn't remember, Satan was an angel of light. Lucifer, but he ended up getting kicked out because his heart wasn't right. That's why Jesus said, I beheld him fall from heaven like lightning. Got to mighty. When God is angry, he's angry. So, uh, so now he's finding his way back uh, up, and now God asks him, he says, what are you doing, Satan? And he says, I'm searching to and fro, uh, looking for someone whom he couldn't consume. And the Lord gave him Job's name. And he said, man, hey, why would I even bother Job? Look at how blessed Job is. You, you got your hands around him. I'm not going to worry about Job. He'll never turn on you. Wasn't that Satan was trying to be right. Satan was trying to find somebody to test. God already knows this. So he says, I removed the hedge. You can touch all of his possessions. You just can't affect his life. And Satan went to work. When you read the rest of the chapter from there, he starts to give Job every test a human being can handle all in a row. We think we've heard some bad news before. You probably heard one piece of bad news, maybe two. Job got almost every piece of bad news you can get all at once in an immediate setting. Bible says that a messenger came to Job, picking up verse number 14, and said, Job, your oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabines attacked and took them all, stole them, they, every one of them. Says, while he was still speaking, said another one came and said, the fire from heaven fell and burned up all of your sheep and your servants and consumed them. And now I'm the only one left to tell the story. Satan is really interesting. He always leaves you one person who's interested in telling you the story. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. It, yeah. See, he wants to affect your heart. He wants you to know. Says the Chaldeans formed three bands, uh, and they came and they stole all his camel. Just keep going, keep going. And says, while he was yet speaking, came another one and says, now thy daughters and thy sons were eating and drinking, at the elders' house, and behold, came a great wind, and from the wilderness it smote the corners of the house, and now they're all dead. So Job has lost his fortune, his family, he's lost his position, Job has lost everything he had all at once by the hand of the enemy whom he didn't even know was doing it. And yet, 
Job took the right response to managing unexpected loss. Let me show it to you. You need to see this in the Word because it blessed me when I figured this out. The first thing the Bible tells us Job did was Job decided to manage his emotions appropriately. That's the first thing he did. He learned how to manage his emotions appropriately. You say, I don't see that in there, Winston. Well, let's look at it. The Bible tells us, it says, then Job arose. He rent his mantle and he shaved his head. Now, when you study this out, this renting of the mantle is really mean he tore his robe. So when Job was doing that, it was his form of coping with the bad news. See, Job didn't go out and blow up people and talk about stuff that happened 50 years ago and cuss people out and act a fool. He said, no, no, no. The first thing he did, he ripped his own robe. He coped with what he was hearing. And then the next thing it says is that he shaved his head. Shaving of the head in biblical times was a ceremonial way to know that you were in the process of mourning. So Job managed his emotions. He decided to cope with the bad news and mourn what he had lost. But he never, ever, ever blew up on the people who were coming in to tell him that. He didn't blow up on his wife. He didn't cuss people out. He didn't kick the dog. He didn't act a fool. He didn't do any of the things sometimes we want to do when we find ourselves in unexpected loss because he knew that wasn't of the Lord. The Holy Ghost said this to me this morning, bless my heart. He says, a hurt heart needs a quiet tongue. Yay! A hurt heart needs a quiet tongue. How many times have we found ourselves murdering people with our mouths because we find ourselves in unexpected loss? Job didn't do it. The Bible says he managed his emotions. Next thing he did uh, is he adjusted his perspective. Job adjusted his perspective. Show me that, Winston. I don't see that in the text. I'll be glad. The Bible says, and he says, naked in this world I came, and naked shall I leave. The Lord giveth, and it's the Lord that taketh away. Now, wait, wait, Winston. This thing was satanically authored. There's no way you're going to say the Lord took it the way. Yes, it was satanically authored, but it still was heavenly approved. The Lord gave it, and the Lord took it the way. Still has to go through heaven's design. Even though it's not my preference, it's still heaven's design. The Lord give it, and the Lord take it the way. I love it. Job adjusted his perspective. He didn't allow what he was going through to bring him to a place where he didn't value God. He viewed everything he had not as something he had obtained on his own. He viewed everything related to him as a blessing that came directly from God. Man, you want to talk about a proper perspective. Everything I have is because of God. There's nothing that I have that's only because of me. Everything I have is because of God. Had he left or forsaken me, the enemy would have rolled over my head. I would have lost all of my life if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. So Job adjusted his perspective. Naked I came and naked I leave. It's the Lord who gave it to me. And it's the Lord who has the right to take it away. And then the third thing Job did is he didn't leave God out or make God the source of his problems. Because the Bible says right after he said that, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed. How strong of a relationship must you have with God? to be walking through the most miserable day of your life. Everything you have is gone. The only thing you're left with are negative friends and a complaining wife. And you say, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Job never made God his problem or complained to God about what was going on. But you can't miss this. The only way Job gets to this place is because he started his response after he finished his worship. See, you, you, you can't have the right response unless you're before the right source to get the right response. You, you got to search the curriculum to even know how to respond correctly. Or your answer is always going to be wrong. And the only way I do that is through worship. The Bible says here, verse number 20, he arose and after he rent his mantle and shaved his head, it says, he fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Man, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. We're never going to be able to mourn appropriately nor heal fully until we find ourselves in a place of God-blessed worship. See, what worship has the unique ability to do is shift my focus from my situation and my problem back onto God so that God can then shift his attention to me and my situation. But if I'm never found in worship, then I'm always distant from God and always forcing my way. Most times what we want to do is focus our attention on our situation and mandate God do what we want. But that's not the word. The Bible says as high as the earth is from the, well, high as the heavens is from the earth, so are God's thoughts from our thoughts. We can never dictate to God what we want when he is calling us to be what he is saying. And the only way we can hear and get to the place we need to be is if we're found in a place of worship. I know praise is fun and it's great and we love it and it makes us dance and we two-step and we thank God and it's awesome. But worship has the ability to shift the heart. Man, I'm telling you, there is nothing more powerful than getting before the Lord in a worship moment. I mean pouring out your heart to God. Not focus on what you want, what you want him to do, what you need from him, what he is, uh, what your day was like, but just getting before him and worshiping. God, I worship you because of who you are. Not what you've done, God. Because of who you are, I give you the glory, God. Even if you do nothing else, God, you've done more than enough. So we have to get ourselves into a place of worship. When we find ourselves in worship, that's the only place we can be found in that's going to help us with our unhealed heart so that we don't have a shifted life and a sifted function. Last scripture, I promise you I'm done. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I promise you I'm almost out of here. Dinner is on the table. Somebody's house. Don't worry. Don't worry. Dinner is coming. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We'll, we'll, we'll look at this out of the new living. Thank you, Fox. You can play softly. We're, we're, we're almost out of here. Second Samuel chapter 12. We'll start reading at verse number 14. So if you're, if you're familiar with this text, this is David here after Nathan has come in and convicted his heart of what he's done to Bathsheba uh, and, and all of that situation. Uh, he's repented before the Lord, and the Lord has given him his judgment. The Lord told him that the child that they had together was going to die. Interestingly, I don't have enough time to go through that, but I guess I'll mention it. I just want to throw this interestingly out there so you can have some fun. Chew on this today. The second son that he and Bathsheba had was the descendant that God used to carry on to Jesus. So that was supposed to eventually be a relationship. David just jumped the gun. Don't worry. You'll get that later. No, I'm going to let that process in your mind later on. Yeah, no, it'll get you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Ho, ho. I know, I know, I know. All right, but the Bible tells us, verse 14 says, Nevertheless, 
because you've shown utter contempt for my word. By doing this, the child will die. After Nathan returned home, the Lord sent a deadly illness upon the child of David and Uriah's wife. Says David, beg God. Man, you want to talk about somewhere. You, I mean, you're pouring out your heart, asking God to change something. Says he went without food and laid all night. He fasted, was praying, calling upon the name of the Lord. Says the elders of the household pleaded with him to get up and eat, but he refused. Then on the seventh day, the Bible says the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him, said he wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill. So why would he start listening to us now? Says, what drastic things will he do when we tell him the child is dead? Says, when David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Says, is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then the Bible says something so powerful, it just revolutionized the way we see things. Says that then David got up from the ground, washed himself, took him a bath, put on some lotion, didn't want to be ashy, changed his clothes, then he went to the tabernacle and worshipped. Man, I'm trying to tell you, the distance from where your heart is now and the hurt you're experiencing to the joy your heart needs to continue to move forward is going to be found when you position your life in worship. It's not going to happen happenstance. It's not going to happen uh, because you want it to. It's not going to even happen because you prayed it. It's going to happen because you were strategic about getting your life and your heart before the Lord and worshiping. And I can promise you this, that if you find your way into worship and you do it with God's heart, not your desire, and let him minister to you, he'll not only change the heart you have, he'll not only minister you joy, but he'll give you some things that will change your life forever. For my Bible tells me, as we said on Wednesday, in his presence is the fullness of joy, but in his right hand are pleasures evermore. If we're going to see his right hand, we're going to find it because we were in worship and not in worry. We were in worship and not in complaint. We were in worship and not in dictation of what we wanted. We were in worship versus trying to be what we want it to be. And God will use that worship to minister to your heart and shift your lives forever. Standing all over the building, if you were blessed by the word, just give God a moment of worship. Just, just begin to honor God for all he is. Honor him for who he is. Yes, God, you are the king of glory, God. You are the Lord God, strong and mighty. There is none like you, God. Oh, God, we honor you this morning, God. We thank you, Lord. We come humble before you, God. For you are high and lifted up, oh, God, with the train that fills the temple, God. And just like the seraphims, God, we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Father, we thank you so much now for your word, God. We thank you that you have poured into us wisdom this morning, God. Truth on how we move forward, God. No, we don't forget, God, and no, we don't rebuke the memories, God, and no, we don't miss the objective of mourning, God, but we humble ourselves in worship and pray you teach us to move forward in you. God, we thank you so much now for what only you can do, Father, speaking to the heart even when it's hurting and giving instructions on how to heal. God, we rebuke the enemy in every attempt to operate in the methods that he wants to use, God. We refuse to blame you. 
We refuse to character compare or character assassinate God. We refuse to do the things, God, that hurt your heart. God, but we're going to handle this moment with joy and with pleasure. For you are God and God alone. And with you, all things are possible. We give you glory now in advance. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Continuing to stand. If there is any in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, what a day to come to know Jesus. Don't miss this opportunity to receive God as your Lord and Savior. He, listen, here's the blessing I love about the Lord. He will never demand anything of you that he hasn't done first. He's teaching us to mourn appropriately because he's had to mourn. Bible tells us that after Jesus died, he caused the sun not to shine from the sixth to the ninth hour. Mourning the loss of his son for the sins of us. So if he mourned Jesus for us, the least we can do is accept Jesus and be with him. Don't leave this place today without accepting Christ is your Lord and Savior. You need Him. I promise you, you need Him. If you say we're all saved, that's great. Or you may be in a position where there's nothing about your life that mimics the life of salvation. The Bible says in Acts that uh, the people watched the lives of Paul and Barnabas and it's here that they came to be known as Christians. It says we watched you and we noticed your behaviors. And what was coming out of your mouth matched your lifestyle. So we believe you are Christians, one who is like Christ. If you are here today and you say, you know what? There's nothing about me that makes me look Christian other than my confession. Then you're in what the Bible calls a backslidden place. And I know that terms hurt your heart, but this is going to bless your life. God is married to the backslider. You can find your way to this altar. There's a restoration in place for you that will change your life forever. I'm believing that God is, oh God, ready to shift somebody's life back into the position that it deserved to be in. He says it's not a start over, but it's a restart. He's ready to give you the life back that he had planned for you. And all you have to do is accept our Lord Jesus and repent still not you and you are here and you say you know what I need a church home I need to be covered it's, it's raining in this world and I need to be covered I need my life watched over and monitored I need a pastor for the Bible tells us that's not even something we can do ourselves only the pastor does that watches over your soul and does it with joy and not with grief if you find yourself here and you say I need a pastor I need somebody to watch over my life. There's no better place than you can be than here. Bishop Hedgeman, oh man, he prays for you. He cares for you. He loves on you. He is there for you. He will cover your life in according to the will of God. Don't leave this place today without receiving what God is saying for you and to you today. Well, if all hearts and minds are clear today, we thank God so much for your word. God, I thank you now that all have declared that none of the positions stated match their heart on today, God. Only you know the position of their heart, God. Search them now, Spirit of the living God. Call them exactly as you see, God. Let them now find themselves in the position you are calling their lives. God, we want none to perish but that all have everlasting life. We love you and we thank you for your word and your way on today. Daddy, we love you. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. What a word on today from Elder Winston. Praise God. Amen. It said, managing my heart after an unexpected loss. That was, that was, that was powerful, brother. That was powerful. Amen. 
All right, now it's, uh, it's time to give. It's time to give. Now go ahead and prepare your hearts. Uh, 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 guys, come on and stand. Come on and stand. We know also giving uh, uh, is a part of worship also. And definitely uh, don't miss out. Don't make your worship be incomplete <laughs> by not uh, having trusted God yet with your finances. Amen. Because we know God's word said he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, also, I know, you know, for that person that hasn't, has yet trusted God with, with their giving, now there are, check it out now, check it out. There are repair, repair man and mechanics that pay tithes. So when your car break down, <laughs> yeah, uh, but we're gonna pay them, and they're gonna pay their tithes. Okay. Anyway, there are four ways to give. <laughs> there are four ways to give. Go ahead and choose one. You guys, ready? Repeat after me. As I tithe faithfully, and so continually. Lord, we thank you. That increase is flowing into my life from multiple directions. Every stream of income that you have ordained is flowing into my life. Streams of compensation, streams of investment, streams of inheritance, and streams of harvest. So therefore, I am blessed. My family is blessed. And my church family is blessed. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and give God a shout of praise. But definitely, I'm going to just re reiterate. Don't limit your blessings because you haven't yet to trust in God and you're given. No, God doesn't change. God's word doesn't change. So uh, if he said that he will open the windows, the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings, uh, he's going to do that. So it's up to you and I to trust God. All right, so it's almost time to, so it, it, it is time to go. <laughs> it is time to go. Father God in heaven, Lord, thank you, Father God, for, for your word on today, Father God. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to live out this word throughout this week, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would convict us if we were, as believers, get off track and do something that's not pleasing to God. Holy Spirit, help us to, to stay on that straight and narrow. And, and, and as Bishop has said many times, we pray that no sloppy work comes from us this week, especially as a believer, a follower of Christ. Lord, help us walk, help our walk, and help our, help our talk to line up with your word, to line up with your will, Father God, so that you are pleased with us, Father God. And Lord, we would be so careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. You guys have a blessed week. We will see you later. Hopefully you were blessed by that word. I told you the Lord was going to speak to your heart. Don't forget to like, share, and comment. Let your friends know to start tuning in. If you have family, if you have co-workers, if you have relatives, let them know, hey, tune in with me. Listen, I'll see you next week at the same time. God bless.